it's 3 p.m. sharp and we have reached more than 30 participants. We can start now. Dr. Ying? Uh, yeah, sure. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our weekly webinar organized by College of Physician Malaysia. We are now in hematology month and the topic for today is approach to hemolytic we are very delighted to have with us today our chairperson, Dr. Liu Kong King, who is consultant hematologist from Hospital Sultana Bahia. And without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Liu. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes. Uh, Thank you for joining us in this uh, College of Physicians uh, webinar, uh, hematology series of webinar. Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Wong Yi Siong. Uh, Dr. Wong is a clinical hematologist in Hospital Sultana Bahia in Johor Bahru. Uh, HSAJP, as you know, is a big center with a large uh, number of patients. So, uh, so he'll be a good position to tell us about uh, an approach to a hemolytic anemia. And with that, Dr. Wong, I pass the floor over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Liu. Am I clear? Can everyone hear me? Hello? Yes, yes. Right. Yeah, oh. we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Liu, for the very kind introduction. And also thank you very much to the organizers for um, extending an invitation uh, to me today to participate in this event. Um, today, I'm going to be sharing with you a little bit about a topic which is um, that can pose a diagnostic and therapeutic challenge and can confound and sometimes even dumbfound a lot of people who, uh, who encounter a case of um, hemolytic anemia. So my name is Wong Yixiong. I'm a hematologist in Hospital Sultana Mina Johor Bahru, and I'm very glad to be able to spend some time with all of you today talking about hemolytic anemia. So as you can see from the title, we're going to go, we're going to take this topic uh, from a top-down approach, and we're going to look at a sensible, rational, rational, and clinically relevant way to approach hemolytic anemia. So in terms of what we are going to be discussing today, I think uh, it's rather important that we lay out uh, our goals and our objectives for this uh, session. Um, I think the first thing we'd like to identify, uh, the first thing we'd like to do is to be able to identify using clinical and biochemical evidence, the presence of hemolysis and hemolytic anemia. We should also have an uh, understanding about how we should establish etiology for cases of hemolytic anemia. And uh, just touching a little bit on initiating treatment, particularly emergent or urgent treatment, and also having a bird's eye view of what the long-term management principles are. So, I think it's important first and foremost to give some context to what exactly hemolytic anemia is. A lot of people have the uh, idea that hemolytic anemia um, are red blood cells bursting in a vessel, which is not entirely wrong. But the actual definition of hemolytic anemia basically refers to an anemia, which is due to a shortened survival of circulating red blood cells due to premature destruction. And that really is the key word there, premature destruction. A typical red blood cell we all know has a lifespan of about 100 to 120 days, about four months. And a red blood cell has certain mechanical and enzymatic qualities which makes it what it is essentially, which gives it its longevity. So firstly, from a mechanical standpoint, the red blood cell has a deformable membrane, a membrane that's malleable, that can squeeze through tiny vessels, and also a supportive cytoskeleton which gives it its structural integrity. At the same time, there's also an enzymatic quality to it, which creates a suitable environment for red blood cell survival and also function. So in a normal aging process, essentially, red blood cells will then uh, be destroyed in an age-dependent fashion. And every single day, about 1% of your red blood cells will be destroyed because of age, because they've, they've reached that point of maturity. And it's important to realize that in hemolytic states, that proportion of red blood cells that's destroyed can be increased dramatically. What happens is uh, in hemolytic anemia is essentially that the severity of this condition is really about how the balance between the extent of hemolysis and also the capacity of the healthy bone marrow to amplify red blood cell production. 
Now, if you looked at this uh, diagram on this right, you will see that essentially um, what happens is when you have hemolysis, regardless of the underlying etiology, what happens is basically the renal system will try to compensate by producing erythropoietin. This then sends a message to the bone marrow and the bone marrow likewise will increase um, erythropoiesis to compensate for this anemic state. And last but not least, in the peripheral blood, what we will see is essentially an increase in reticulite site count followed by mature red blood cell. Just to give you an idea of what we are dealing with essentially. Moving along to establishing etiology. Now we need to consider first and foremost that there are certain broad etiological concepts. These broad etiological concepts are important because they help to guide and they help to frame a very directed uh, investigative approach, which we will go into a bit more detail a little further on. So what are the etiological concepts basically? First and foremost, um, some people like to divide it according to whether it's intra or extravascular. That's fine. Some people like to use a temporal relationship by talking about acute versus chronic. Um, for the purposes of today's discussion, let's consider the etiological concepts of it being inherited versus acquired. And within this um, particular etiological concept, let's talk about how it can be immune versus non-immune mediated. Now, if you were to look at basically the different causes of hemolysis, whether they're inherited or acquired, you can see the inherited causes are related to three main subtypes. Basically, you have your enzyme deficiencies, the most common of which would be G6PD, hemoglobinopathies, for example, sickle cell disease, thalassemias, and of course, you also have membrane disorders like hereditary spherocytosis, hereditary elliptocytosis, and hereditary stomatocytosis. Now, for purposes of today's discussion, and given the time constraints, let's just put the inherited causes aside, and let's talk about the acquired causes. Now, even so, it's a pretty long list, as you can see here. We've got everything from liver disease to infections to toxins. And what I would like to focus on today is I would like to talk a little bit more about the diseases in the little blue box there. These are the immune-mediated causes. And let's talk a little bit more about these conditions because I think um, from the perspective of, um, of the cases that we see on a day-to-day -day basis, these are the, co the, the cases that you will be most likely to encounter that you will need to have a general understanding of how to diagnose and how to treat and probably warrants a little bit more of our attention today. But I will also be talking about some of the other causes here in this acquired list, uh, at least things that are a bit more relevant. Okay, so let's have so when faced with this situation where you have a patient who you think might have hemolytic anemia and you're asking yourself, what exactly am I dealing with? And these questions tend to pop up at 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning when you're on call. I think the important thing is to ask the right questions. And what are the right questions? Let's go through them one by one. The first question is simple enough, basically. Is there anemia? And this is something that we can all answer with a clinical assessment, looking for evidence of anemia, such as, for example, conjunctival pallor, looking for evidence of hemodynamic instability, and in almost any healthcare facility, whether you're in a clinic or a hospital, point of care testing is available and a full blood count will easily tell you if there's anemia. Of course, it, it makes sense, but probably worth mentioning that we should rule out any alternative causes of anemia, such as bleeding or potentially a lab error. If you see an exceedingly stable patient with a hemoglobin of two, it's probably going to be a problem with a lab rather than a problem with the patient. So it's probably worth thinking about this. But the next question is probably a little more pertinent to our discussion today. The next question is, is there evidence of hemolysis? So to do this, we really need to do three things. We need to take a really good history. We need to do a physical examination that's comprehensive. And we need to have a preliminary investigative strategy. So I think the clinical assessment is something that we're all quite familiar with, but let's just talk about it a little bit. So in the history, in the physical examination, in, in the overall clinical assessment, you'll be looking about, you'll be looking at things such as the rapid, whether there's a rapid onset of symptoms of anemia, particularly in the absence of bleeding. This usually suggests that there is some element of brisk hemolysis. For example, if you have a patient that had a hemoglobin of 14 a few days ago, and now he comes in with a hemoglobin of 3, but he's not bleeding, hemolysis, particularly brisk hemolysis, really should be one of the things you're thinking about. Now, jaundice and scleroicterus can be seen in hemolysis. And of course, hemoglobinuria, where a patient complains of very dark colored urine, this is indicative of intravascular hemolysis. Now, past medical history is always important. Ask about blood transfusions. Ask about whether there are any new medications. These are all vital information which could help to frame not just your diagnostic approach, but also the way that you treat the patient.
Of course, always ask about the family history. The answer might be something as simple as a hemoglobinopathy that has been existing in the family for a while. So it's worthwhile getting these questions out of the way. Investigate for gallstones. Look for features of gallstones because these usually indicate some evidence of chronic hemolysis that could have overwhelmed the reticular endothelial system. Splenomegaly is also another very important thing to pick up. And of course, lymphadenopathy. And why exactly? We'll talk about that a little bit further on in our discussion. So to frame and to direct your preliminary investigative strategy is essentially one thing. Let's prove that there is hemolysis. And the tests that you can do are all accessible, are all available, and are all readily provided by most of the institutions that we work in. Sending a full blood count, of course, you want to look at your platelets and your w blood, uh, white blood cell. These can give you some information, but essentially you're looking at the hemoglobin. And of course, you're also trying to identify the reticular site count. LDH or lactic dehydrogenase levels are very important. The bilirubin level, particularly if you can get a breakdown of the direct and indirect levels. And of course, peripheral blood film. There are also some other useful tests that we can do, particularly urinalysis, looking for hemosiderin for intravascular hemolysis and serum haptoglobin. Now, serum haptoglobin is a really sensitive test for hemolysis. You get very low levels in cases of hemolysis, but this is not a test that is readily available locally, so we probably won't talk about it that much. Let's talk about what we do have. Let's talk about what we can access, and it's essentially these tests. So, of course, when you have a hemoglobin level that's low, that's an evidence of anemia. That's an evidence of hemolysis if some of the other parameters are positive. A reticular site count is always important because when you have hemolysis, you essentially have peripheral destruction of red blood cell. A person that has a healthy bone marrow should be able to compensate for this state of anemia by increasing the number of immature red blood cells or reticular sites. So you expect that level to be high. An LDH level is always useful because if it's increased, it's usually suggestive or it could I point towards a, a possibility of hemolysis and, of course, a raised bilirubin levels. So sometimes when you have a hematologist asking for hemolytic markers, these are some of the things that we are essentially asking for. And I cannot stress how important a peripheral blood film is. Now, I will be the first person to concede that when we talk about a peripheral blood film, a lot of us think that this, is, uh, this belongs in the lab we clinicians should not have to worry about a peripheral blood film, just give us the report. But I think it's of value to be a well-rounded clinician, to consider that all these investigations, particularly in the case of hemolytic anemia, will present with morphologically suggestive features. Now, we might not need to know what they look like, although they can be quite pretty to look at and it's interesting to know, but let's find out some of the interesting terms which can give us an idea of what the different etiologies of hemolysis are. For example, in this first case, look at the red arrows. These are schistocytes of fragmented red blood cells, and you see them in cases of thrombotic microangiopathies. Really important because most diagnoses with thrombotic microangiopathies or um, a MAHA picture or microangiopathic hemolytic anemia picture usually suggest that it's a medical emergency, so it's a sign for us to really act fast. And over here, you have basically a little red cell smaller than the, air, the normal red cell. And most importantly, it's lost its central pallor. Now, this is the central pallor of a normal red blood cell. This cell doesn't have it. This cell also looks visibly smaller. And this is essentially a spherocyte. You can see it in inherited conditions like hereditary spherocytosis. But it's also important to know that in acquired hemolytic anemia, like for example, uh, a warm IHA or cold IHA, or those conditions, you might actually see a microspherocyte such as this. So that's something for you to pick out in the, in the report. And this over here identifies agglutination, a whole bunch of red blood cells all clumped together. That's seen in cold agglutinin disease. Over here, you've got your dacrocytes or teardrop cells, which you might remember uh, are present in cases of thalassemia. Here, you have a red blood cell that instead of having a rounded central pallor, has a long slit in the middle. And this is a stomatocyte. And we see it in a case of hereditary stomatocytosis. And over here, we have what we call a target cell. Self-explanatory, really, but you see these in cases of thalassemia. So knowing what these words represent, can give you a clue and can help you interpret a peripheral blood film in a more comprehensive, in a more clinically relevant manner. And I think it's quite useful to know.
Now, the third question, probably the most important question is, does it warrant urgent attention? If you have a patient that has hemodynamic instability, the blood pressure is dropping to the floor, the patient is tachycardic, it looks unwell, if the patient has an acute thrombosis, the patient has seizures, or if any of the lab parameters suggest that there are intractable anemia, an anemia which cannot be corrected by blood transfusions, or schistocytes on the peripheral blood film, like we mentioned a little bit earlier on, or evidence of renal impairment, these are all suggestions that we should probably act a little bit quicker. Then these patients would, wor would warrant an urgent referral to a hematologist, and we will need to consider certain differentials, um, differentials of hemolytic anemia, which which require us to act a little bit more promptly and a little bit more urgently. Cases of thrombotic microangiopathy, for example, or even acute hemolytic transfusion reaction. But if you don't have any of these features and the answer is that the patient probably doesn't need urgent attention, then we can adopt a more measured, more considered approach to how we investigate. So I'd like to begin the next question by actually saying that like when we ask in our history, it's really quite important to just ask about blood transfusions. In blood transfusion, you know, in blood transfusions uh, can be complicated and you can have hemolytic transfusion reactions. There are two main types. Most of us know about an acute hemolytic transfusion reaction, which is typically uh, occurs very early on in the transfusion. After the administration of as little as just a few milliliters of incompatible blood, and it's usually the result of ABO blood group incompatibility. But technically, it can occur anywhere up to 24 hours post-transfusion. I think this is something that has been really drilled into us to pick up, and it's not really a problem. But delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions can present with hemolysis, and they can also occur anywhere from up to one to two weeks, and even technically based on the definition, anyway, up to four weeks following a transfusion. So just asking this simple question of whether there are any recent transfusions is important and provides significant clinical value because when you can determine this very early on in the diagnostic process, you can offer the type of supportive management which you might be distracted from doing if you were on a, on a wild goose chase for the other causes of hemolytic anemia. So I think it's quite important to just ask a simple question early on. Likewise, I would also ask this question, whether there's any likely causes that are inherited in nature. If there's a suggestive family history, or this patient has had a lifelong history of anemia, has been transfused since he or she was a child, or there are any physical examinations findings suggestive of extra medullary hematopoiesis, then your, your investigations will probably be a lot more short, a little bit more targeted, and you probably wouldn't have to do so many different tests. So ask these questions early, get them out of the way, help yourself, uh, help yourself structure the way you approach these patients. But really, at the end of the day, say all of those questions are not answered, and we arrive at the last and final question. One test that's of high, of a very significant importance is really the Coombs test or the direct antiglobulin test. So the question is, is a DAT test positive or is it negative? If it's positive, it usually suggests an immune-mediated cause. And if it's negative, it's usually suggestive of a, of a non-immune-mediated cause. So we'll talk about the immune-mediated cause in, in quite extensive nature in a little while. But when you talk about non-immune-mediated causes, what exactly are you dealing with? Well, there's a whole list of possibilities here with pathognomonic or at least significant characteristics in history and examination and blood smear. I won't go through this entire list, but it's worth knowing and at least understanding that there are a myriad uh, possibilities when it comes to a negative uh, uh, Coombs positive, uh, a negative Coombs uh, hemolytic anemia. So let's talk about what are the possible causes of hemolytic anemia that give you a positive Coombs result. So many a time when you get a referral or you make a referral about hemolytic anemia, um, this question will inevitably pop up. Have we done a Coombs test? Have we done a direct antigoblin test? And saying that a disease is positive or negative is really rather meaningless if we don't know exactly what the possible causes are. So let's have an idea generally of what they might be. And I think the big one that everyone probably knows about is the autoimmune hemolytic anemia. You have your warm eye heart, you have your cold agglutinin disease, and you have paroxysmal whole, uh, cold hemoglobinuria. We probably won't talk about this last one because it makes up only about 1% of cases of autoimmune hemolytic anemia, whereas warm eye heart is about 66%, about two thirds, and cold agglutinin disease is also quite common, about 25 to 30%. So these two diseases will take our focus for today. But there are also some other 
Coombs positive causes of hemolytic anemia. If you are dealing with a very, very young patient, probably not for the, the audience today, but you might also want to consider hemolytic disease of the newborn. If you have a history of a transfusion, think about acute and delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions like we discussed a little bit earlier. And one cause that's commonly missed, drug-induced causes of hemolytic anemia. So this is a question that really gives a lot of people a lot of grief. And I admit that I am no expert at it, but let me try and share with you what little I know. So essentially, when we want to do a Coombs test, what happens is we take what we call anti-human anti globulin, essentially. And this anti-human globulin is added to the patient's blood. When you do a direct Coombs test, what you're essentially trying to see, you're trying to identify if there are any immunoglobulins attached to the surface of the red blood cell. So this is the patient's red blood cell. As you can see, since this patient has, for example, hemolytic and autoimmune hemolytic anemia, there are antibodies, in this case, autoantibodies produced by the patient himself, stuck on the surface of these red blood cells. This direct antiglobulin that we use or anti-human globulin that we use is essentially an antibody against an antibody. So it will find and seek out these immunoglobulins and bind to them and cause a reaction such as this, where you have essentially agglutination. In an indirect antiglobulin or Coombs test, you're not testing the red blood cells, you're testing the patient's plasma, looking for antibodies floating about. So for this test, you will need to not only add in the anti-human globulin, which is here, you're also adding the red blood cells in, looking for agglutination. So that's a general idea of how this test is done. I would go into deeper explanation, but I'm unfortunately, I'm probably not the most qualified person. But let's look at how it translates to our clinical practice. So let's look at this first diagram on the top here. This is a case of warm IHA. In warm IHA, the patient's red blood cells here are coated with IgG or immunoglobulin G. These are antibodies produced by the patient themselves as part of the disease process. So we call them autoantibodies. When you add in the anti-human globulin, in this case, the anti-IgG, it reacts with these uh, uh, immunoglobulin G, and as a result of that causes agglutination. What happens is, in a case of warm IHA, these red blood cells become opsonized. They are covered and coated with this immunoglobulin. They travel to the spleen, and essentially, the red blood cell, uh, uh, the white blood cells, sorry, the macrophages in the spleen deem these uh, red blood cells very tasty. They've been marinated and coated with these immunoglobulins. So the macrophages will take a bite out of these red blood cells, producing your spherocytes and, and causing uh, a premature destruction of these red blood cells. So in warm IHA, you say that the direct antiglobulin test or the Coombs test is positive for IgG. In a case of cold IHA or cold agglutinin disease, the problem isn't with IgG. The problem is that the patient produces immunoglobulin M or IgM. Now, the first thing you can notice right off the bat is the IgM is a lot bigger than the IgG. We call it a pentameric um, a pattern, essentially, because there are five um, aspects to it. So this IgM, because it's so much larger, will attach to the surface of the red blood cells. And because it can span across a few red blood cells, it will cause all these red cells to agglutinate together when you look in the peripheral blood film, which gives us the picture that we saw a little bit earlier. Now, this IgM does a few things. Number one, it also covers and opsonizes the red blood cells so that when it goes to the spleen and liver, it's eaten up by the macrophages. But it also initiates and activates your complement system. So besides IgM being stuck on the red blood cells, you also have a complement stuck on the red blood cells, in this case, C3. So when this happens, you can also not just have extravascular hemolysis, but you can actually have intravascular hemolysis because of what we call a membrane attack complex, which is essentially the end result of uh, the activation of the complement system. So to put things simply, when you get a uh, Coombs test result, if you are dealing with a case of warm IHA, you are going to see IgG being positive. It can be a negative for C3, but it can also be positive for some complement. There can be some element of complement, but the key thing really is to look out for the IgG. In fact, more than half of cases of warm IHA actually have some element of complement involved, and only about 35 to 40% are purely IgG positive. But in cold agglutinin disease, you're essentially looking at almost 80% of cases being only C3D positive. So this gives you a little bit of an idea. And 
a lot of um, uh, hematologists, far more senior and far more intelligent than I, have also highlighted the fact that you should never consider a Coombs test in isolation. Take the overall clinical picture, take the peripheral blood film, look at all these things in context of one another and look for how they interact with one another to give you a diagnosis of whether it's a warm eye heart or cold agglutinin disease. So it's also important to note that not every case of positive Coombs will have hemolysis. And likewise, not every case of hemolysis will be positive for Coombs test. In fact, 98.4% of your Coombs test positivity will not actually be present, uh, will not actually cause autoimmune hemolytic anemia. You, it's the diseases or it's the patients that exist in this intersection where there is evidence of clinical hemolysis through your, your history, through your physical examination, through your investigations, and when you have a positive Coombs test that fall in this category that we are so commonly seeing. But 5 to 10% of patients are actually have something called that negative IHA, or basically Coombs negative IHA. So as we discussed a little bit earlier, Coombs positivity does not always necessarily indicate the presence of hemolysis. And it's also important to note that the quote-unquote strength of your Coombs actually has a very poor clinical correlation with the severity of hemolysis and anemia. It doesn't mean that if the Coombs test is very positive, you're going to have a very bad degree of hem uh, hemolysis and likewise anemia. So let's focus on a few commonly seen diseases today and let's talk about them in greater depth. Let's talk about warm IHA. Let's talk about cold agglutinin disease. Let's also touch a little bit about drug-induced hemolytic anemia. Now, it's a whole different topic, but I think it's important for us to know what the thrombotic microangiopathies are because these diseases are very important for us to pick up because they require very urgent investigation and also management. So let's talk about warm eye heart. Now, warm eye heart, you can essentially define it as a chronic relapsing disease, and it's characterized by a few things. You have anemia, you have reticulocytosis because your bone marrow is trying to compensate, you have lab evidence of hemolysis, your quote-unquote hemolytic markers, and importantly, in most cases, you also have a positive Coombs test. So looking at the PBF, there are a few things that we would like to look out for. This arrow here shows your microspherocyte, we've talked about that. But look at these larger cells here. If you look really closely, you will notice that they are slightly bluish tinge. Now, they are reticulocytes essentially, and they give the polychromatic appearance of a blood film because this bluish tinge can contrast with the slightly reddish nature of a mature blood cell, giving you the appearance of multiple colors on the blood film, hence the word poly and chromatia. So warm eye heart is not um, something that's very uncommon. You see one to three cases per 100,000 persons. The median age of onset is usually in middle age, around 50 years of age. There's a slight female predominance. There's a relationship to autoimmune diseases. But I think it's important for us to just have an idea of how exactly warm eye heart develops. Now, basically, as we mentioned a bit earlier, in warm eye heart, the problem really is your IgG autoantibodies produced by the patient themselves. We call these... Um, antibodies panagglutinins because they lack specificity. We've all heard of allo antibodies, people who have been transfused before, they develop antibodies against certain antigens on the donated red blood cell, but those allo antibodies are very specific for certain red cell antigens. Not the case in warm eye heart. These autoantibodies are or panagglutinins lack specificity and they can attach to basically anything on the surface of the red blood cell. So moving along to this diagram, you can see in warm IHA, the problem, as we mentioned, is IgG antibodies. What we have essentially is these antibodies, they have an optimal temperature to which they react, and that's the body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius, hence the term warm IHA. These IgG antibodies will react against the protein antigen on the red blood cell surface, coating them, marinating them, and when they go to the spleen, the macrophages in the reticuloendothelial system will eat at them, take a bite out of them and turn them into spherocytes, which is what we saw in the blood film a little bit earlier on. All of this is representative of extravascular hemolysis. So what are the different causes of warm eye harm? Warm eye harm is not necessarily a disease per se. There is an underlying etiology. It could be primary or quote unquote idiopathic. And in 40 to 50% of the cases, that's the case. But it's also important to know that there are secondary causes, 60% of cases, and they can range from um, lymphoproliferative disorders, for example, like lymphoma or chronic lymphocytic leukemia. You can even have non-lymphoid malignancies. A very commonly quoted example is that of uh, ovarian tumors. 
any disease, autoimmune disease like SLE, even rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, anything which causes immune dysregulation and chronic inflammatory diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, for example. And there are certain drugs that can also precipitate warm eye heart. So these are some of the things that you need to, to identify. So when it comes to managing a case of warm eye heart, a lot of us know to give steroids. But prior to even starting any medication, let's talk about some of the general principles. A lot of, question, a lot of time we get the question of whether we should transfuse patient with warm eye heart. And there are very clear cut indications um, as to when we should tr uh, transfuse patients. Um, a lot of data and a lot of evidence suggests that a hemoglobin of less than six. But what I really want to hammer home is that when you want to transfuse a patient with warm eye harm, there are really some significant challenges. I'm sure all of, us, all of us have experienced this before. It's really tough to secure cross-match compatible bloods because, you, because of the panagglutinins that are present. And because a lot of times patients might have actually been transfused before, they might actually have allo antibodies on top of the auto antibodies which they've already got. So this adds an added layer of complexity and challenge to securing blood products. But really, it all harks back to the indication. We really should only think about transfusing patients with warm eye heart with blood products or PAC cells when there's some evidence of hemodynamic compromise or when you think that there might be hemodynamic compromise you know, shortly down the line. This is something that's really important. And another thing that's fairly simple to do, but has real clinical utility is just the provision of folic acid. A lot of times we think that warm eye has an acute event, but the real issue is it's a chronic disease. It relapses and remits. And even when the patient seems to be fine and the patient's out of the hospital and the patient's hemoglobin is normal, there can be some element of chronic hemolysis. This chronic hemolysis causes folate deficiency due to the increased folate requirements for compensatory red blood cell production. So it's important for us to remember to just give folic acid supplementation when the patient is seen in our clinics and the patient is seen in our wards. VTE prophylaxis is also really important. Any hemolysis will increase the risk of a patient developing thromboembolism or venous thromboembolism. And this is particularly so for patients who happen to be inpatients, patients who are immobile or have any of the other risk factors associated with thrombosis. So this is something that we should always think about. A lot of times when we uh, want to start venous thromboembolic, uh, VTE prophylaxis, we see that the hemoglobin of the patient is really, really low, and this can be rather off-putting. Now, I agree, it's, it's a cause of concern, but if you are fairly confident in your clinical judgment, there's no active bleeding, there's no real reason or contraindication for this, I don't think a low hemoglobin per se would be a reason to stop yourself from giving VTE prophylaxis. You just need to exercise prudent, careful clinical judgment. And of course, treating the underlying condition. 50 to 60% of cases of warm eye heart actually have some sort of underlying associated disorder which causes immune dysregulation. So try to work out for these conditions, try to identify whether they are there, and if they are there, treat these underlying disorders. You might not always lead to the resolution of hemolysis, or even if it does, it might be slow, but it's definitely something that needs to be done. Now, when it comes to the therapeutic options, there are first-line treatments, there are second-line treatments, there are third-line treatments. First-line treatments are pretty straightforward, something we all know, starting glucocorticoids. Uh, you have a few options. If you want to go the oral route, you can give prednisolone at one to two milligrams per day. If you feel that intravenous uh, route is required, of course, you can give methylprednisolone, 500 milligrams to one gram per day. But I think it's important for us to remember that for steroids, Generally, while well, the response rate is really quite, quite significant, 70 to 80, 75 to 80 percent, the time for it to work or the time to respond is 7 to 25 days. So it's not something that's going to be immediate. It's not something that warrants us picking up the phone and calling for help because the steroids were started yesterday and the hemoglobin today hasn't really risen yet. We have to understand that it needs a little bit of time to work. But the remission rate of patients on steroids is high. It's about 20 to 30%, and this does influence our management. Now, if patients don't respond to first-line treatment, what are the second-line treatments that we have? Now, more often than not, we think that the second-line treatments would be immunosuppressive agents, for example, cyclosporine or uh, azathioprine. The truth is the, 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 we are shifting our way of treating patients with autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and the second-line treatments are really these uh, options. Rituximab, an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody, really useful and 
um, we give it basically every week, four doses, so the patient can usually complete the treatment uh, on an outpatient basis over the course of a month, has a response rate of close to 90%. The time for it to work is some time. It takes about three to six weeks before you really see the effect. But as a second line option with a view for long-term control, this is something that we should really consider. Though it's important to always check for hepatitis B infection prior to starting this because it can cause reactivation of hepatitis B. And the relapse-free survival has always been shown to be more efficacious, to be more uh, impressive when combined together with steroids rather than when given alone. Now, IVIG is also something that we like to use in the emergency situation, and you can give it in a, a variety of ways. The response rate usually isn't that uh, isn't that uh, groundbreaking. It's about forty to fifty percent, but the time to treatment the time to response is a one to five days, usually peaking at around two to three days. So in a situation such as this, it's an option that you can consider when you are dealing with a patient that's inpatient, that needs, uh, that you're trying to push up the hemoglobin as quickly as possible. So that's usually quite useful. But the responses are transient and you have to have some backbone of therapy to consider. Now, one thing that um, is not used as frequently as it should is the use of a splenectomy. A splenectomy has a response rate of 80%, but... It doesn't work instantaneously, but it's something that can be useful and potentially curative in up to half of patients. You will need to vaccinate patients. You will need to uh, start them on antibiotic prophylaxis, but it's something that we should really be thinking about more often. Although it seems counterproductive to want to operate on somebody that's already coming in anemic, it's something that should be really considered as one of the many tools in our arsenal. The third line agents, essentially, we have we have got uh, immunomodulators like azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, cyclosporine, and even danazol. As a general rule of thumb, the response rate of these agents is usually around the 50% mark, ranging from 40 to 60%. They take about one to two months to work, and they all have their significant uh, adverse effects. It's not that we should avoid these medications, but let's also think about how um, we can utilize our second line agents a little bit more. Now. Um, Let's move on to cholagglutinin disease. Now, cholagglutinin disease basically is a condition affected, of course, by cholagglutinins. And these are also autoantibodies against red blood cells, and they are usually active below the normal body temperature. They result in RBC agglutination, as you can see over here, extravascular hemolysis, and of course, anemia. The usual age of presentation is usually a bit later, so about mid to late 60s. And understanding the pathophysiology um, will help us to understand why the peripheral blood film picture is as such. As I discussed a bit earlier, the autoantibodies at fault are your IgM autoantibodies, and these have a pentameric conformation, which can span the distance of several red blood cells. So it basically brings your red blood cells into close opposition, like so, binds them all together and causes RBC agglutination, particularly in the acral parts of the body, which are the peripheries essentially, and they're colder. The classical complement pathway is also activated by the IgM antibody. And as a result of that, your RBCs are coated with a complement, your C3, which is what you pick up in your Coombs test. These C3 coated cells will then travel to the spleen, to the liver, where they're eaten up by macrophages, and also within the blood vesicle, cause intravascular hemolysis because of the direct lysis of these red blood cells. So the clinical manifestations, you can get Raynaud's phenomenon, you can get patients that have cold-induced acrocyanosis, up to 60 to 70% of patients will have this, and levido reticularis. So there are also some etiological mechanisms for cold agglutinin disease. You can have primary or idiopathic cold agglutinin disease, usually indicating the absence of an underlying disorder. But as time has gone by, we have come to realize that despite us saying that there is no quote-unquote underlying disorder, most cases of primary co-agglutinin disease actually produce a monoclonal co-agglutinin, which means it produces an uh, immunoglobulin that comes from, that all looks the same. They all come from the same clone. And all of this essentially suggests that there is, at the heart of it all, at the crux of it, a clonal proliferation of cells from a lymphoproliferative disorder. And this will really help to frame the way we investigate, the way we treat patients with coagulating disease. Now, there are also some secondary causes. Uh, commonly, we all know like infections like mycoplasma and pneumonia, even infectious mononucleosis can cause it. Autoimmune diseases, 
And of course, your malignant causes like your B-cell lymphoproliferative disorders. So when it comes to your investigations, nothing very specific that I would like to point out, but there are a few things that are important. Your full blood count might actually give you a macrocytosis, a spurious macrocytosis at that, because what your machine is actually picking up are all the red blood cells that are clumped together. So it thinks that it's a really large red blood cell, hence macrocytosis, but in truth, it's just your red blood cells that are all stuck to one another. Your direct uh, uh, agglutinin test or your Coombs test will give you C3D positivity. And of course, your cold, you, it's worthwhile in certain circumstances to measure the cold agglutinin titer, which tends to be more than 1 in 64. You can also do a serum protein electrophoresis in these patients, where in most cases, you will have IgM kappa in more than 90% of cases. Now, heralding to what I was saying a little bit earlier, where I talked about how even in cases of primary co-agglutinin disease, it's, we think that there is a clonal lymphoproliferative process at the heart of it. Hence, doing an immunophenotyping is really quite useful because you can actually try and identify if there are clonal B lymphocytes. Even if the bone marrow, from a morphological standpoint, doesn't actually show a diagnosis of lymphoma. It's also very important when you have a patient with co agglutinin disease, always remember to screen for lymphoproliferative disorders because many a times there can be no lymph node enlargement, the patient can have no B symptoms, but the thing that heralds or the thing that is a harbinger for patients with a lymphoproliferative disorder is a co-agglutinin disease. So do a C contrasted CT scan, do a bone marrow examination if possible. Try really, really hard to find or at the very least rule out the presence of any obvious lymphoproliferative disorders. I think this is truly quite important. In terms of management, now the anemia is usually quite mild. There's not much treatment is typically needed. It's usually just advice. Transfusion, if it's needed, we always try to run it through a blood warmer. We tell the patient to avoid cold environments, not particularly relevant in Malaysia, particularly over the last couple of weeks, but this is something that we would tell our patients. And of course, considering that cold gluten disease, most of it are secondary in nature, try to identify whether there's any underlying disease. As a general rule of thumb, steroids, spinectomies can be tried, but they're not generally effective. And our change or sea change in direction of care has really been based on the understanding that uh, cold agglutinin disease is essentially a low-grade clonal lymphoproliferative disorder resulting in complement-dependent hemolysis. So to treat a clonal disorder, we use chemoimmunotherapy. There are certain options that we can consider. Some patients will just use rituximab alone. Uh, for some uh, patients, we can consider this. Certain uh, options include the use of uh, bendamustine and rituximab, and you can even try fludarabine and rituximab, although this is something that's probably a little bit beyond the scope of today's discussion. But it's good to sort of know that these options exist and uh, good to tell patients about the possible therapeutic considerations. Now, drug-induced hemolysis is a really large topic. I don't think we have the time to go in very great depth, but know that drugs can essentially cause hemolysis through a variety of manners. It can be immune-mediated, for which you will have a positive Coombs test, but you will also have drug-induced hemolysis that is oxidative in nature. You can also have thrombotic microangiopathy, and you can also have met hemoglobinemia. So the general principles is that basically um, a Peripheral blood film will give you some really good information. If you see typical bite or blister cells that's suggestive of oxidative hemolysis in patients with or without G6PD deficiency, you can also see spherocytes, like what we talked a little bit earlier, if this is an immune-mediated hemolysis, schistocytes, if it's because of a drug-related cause of thrombotic microangiopathy, Hemoglobin urea is also another possibility in cases of intravascular hemolysis seen in uh, thrombotic microangiopathy situations. You can also have patients who are Coombs positive in immune-mediated causes. The main treatment, simple enough, identify the possible offending agent and stop it. So drug discontinuation. The drug, if you have correctly identified that it's the cause, try to avoid it indefinitely with a plan for future drug avoidance clearly indicated in the medical record. There are some specific therapies. For example, if you think it's immune-mediated, steroids and even IVIG could be used. And methemoglobinemia as a cause of drug-induced hemolysis, you can use methylene blue and ascorbic acid. But uh, please refer these patients to your uh, friendly uh, hematologist for further uh, approach and guidance with regards to this.
Now, I think it's quite important to just spend the last few minutes talking very quickly about thrombotic microangiopathies. This is a huge topic, and we could spend the next one, two hours just talking about this. But I think it's important to highlight this because thrombotic microangiopathies, basically, you see it, if you see any of these words in a peripheral blood film, if you have any inkling that it might be this case, you probably want to refer to hematologists for advice and guidance. Now, these conditions or this group of conditions basically are characterized by a typical picture known as MAHA or microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So in MAHA, what you essentially see or have is it's a non-immune hemolytic anemia and you have intravascular red blood cell fragmentation. So the hemolysis is intravascular and it produces a very typical blood film picture where you have schistocytes, your fragmented red blood cells. You can even have something called helmet cells such as this you can have microspherocytes, like what we discussed earlier. You can have here a large platelet. Now, the key to identifying MAHA is that it gives you a hemolytic picture with schistocytes. And more often than not, there is thrombocytopenia. So when there is a low platelet level, you have large platelets because your bone marrow is trying to compensate. It's pumping out immature platelets, which are much larger than mature platelets, and hence, all of these pictures, when considered in a constellation, give you an idea that you might be considering a case of maha or thrombotic microangiopathy. And TMA basically describes a pathological lesion where you have your small vessels like your arterioles and capillaries that are all blocked and it produces a microvascular thrombosis. Now, the causes of maha, uh, uh, there are quite a number of them. You have TTP which can be in inherited or acquired forms. You can have hemolytic uremic syndrome, which can be caused by a shiga toxin or even complement mediated. Drugs can cause maha. Transplants, for example, stem cell transplants for hematological uh, conditions or even solid organ transplants can cause uh, an entity known as transplant-associated thrombotic microangiopathy. And there are also multiple systemic diseases, anything from diffuse intravascular coagulation to infections to malignancies, to severe hypertension, connective tissue diseases. And as is the bane of most people doing internal medicine, when you have a call from the ONG doctors about the maha on a blood, peripheral blood film, side of call, the sort of call that sends a chill up your spine, essentially. Think about things like HELP syndrome. Think about things like severe preeclampsia. These can all cause maha. But really, let's just talk about the first two conditions. And let's focus on some salient clinical points. Now, TTP versus HUS in general, um, TTP is essentially when you have a deficiency of ADAMTS13. If it's an inherited form or congenital form, basically you have an absence of it. But if you have an acquired form, you develop an auto antibody against ADAMTS13. And it's important to know that besides giving you a MAHA picture, the typical description in the case of TTP is somebody who comes in with a MAHA picture with neurological symptoms, seizures, altered mental status. You can have a very severe thrombocytopenia. Renal impairment can be, can be seen, but it's usually not as commonly described as compared to when it's seen in hemolytic uremic syndrome. Patients can be febrile, and the treatment is a plasma exchange. Whereas in uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome or atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, the problem or the crux is essentially complement dysregulation. It could be due to a mutation. It could be due to an autoantibody. You will also have a MAHA picture. You can also have neurological symptoms, but what's really more prominent is renal impairment. So if you have MAHA and you have a patient with a deranged renal profile with thrombocytopenia, think of the possibility of hemolytic uremic syndrome. The treatment of this is eculizumab, which is basically a complement inhibitor. Um, probably won't need to go too deep into this at this point in time. But what is important is how do you generally approach a case of uh, thrombotic microangiopathy? When you see MAHA on your PBF, Usually, your hematopathologist will be happy to give you a call to let you know that there is a patient with this particular finding on the peripheral blood film. And combined with thrombocytopenia, look for neurological features, new for renal features. Think about all the other possible causes. Has the patient undergone a transplant recently? Does he have an existing malignancy? Does he have drugs uh, that could possibly cause it? If none of these are available and you think that it might possibly be TTP, always send ADAMTS13. ADAMTS13 testing should be sent before any plasma exchange. And ADAMTS13 essentially provides value because 
um, it will help you to diagnose a case of TTP further down the line. But in all circumstances, we usually consider treating a patient with suspected TTP based on a presumptive diagnosis before the ADAMTS-13 levels are available. But really what's most important, if you think that any of these features exist, just give us a call. Let's try to sort this problem out together. So let me just uh, finish off today's presentation by highlighting a few key points. When it comes to establishing a diagnosis, I think the important thing is for us to ask the right questions. Firstly, is there anemia? Secondly, is there hemolysis? Thirdly, is there an urgency? And fourthly, fourthly what's the Coombe test show? And is it immune mediated? Uh, take advantage of all the tools available, our full blood count, hemolytic markers, our peripheral blood film, our Coombs test, and have a targeted investigative approach. But most importantly, recognize that there are causes of hemolytic anemia which really do warrant urgent management and referral, and let's try to act as quickly as possible. With that, I'm happy to end my presentation for today. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wong, for an excellent and very comprehensive overview on actually a very uh, broad topic. Okay? Uh, for the sake of time, let's jump straight to the uh, questions. All right. Um, the first question we had that is, if a patient has symptomatic hemolytic, I think you have partially talked about, you have talked about this in your talk, but probably we we'll just go through it again. If a patient has symptomatic hemolytic anemia, can we transfuse back cells? And, uh, or at what level of HP should we transfuse? You want to take that? Yeah, sure. So um, like what I alluded to in my um, presentation, uh, I don't think we should really use a, a, a level per se. I don't think if somebody comes in with a HP of um, less than five or less than six, then that's really a, a, a written in stone kind of indication. I think really a lot of it has to do with the patient's clinical status. If the patient is... Um, hemodynamically unstable, if the patient has a low blood pressure, then of course transfusion is definitely indicated. But uh, I wouldn't say that there's a level of HP that we should really think about. Although most guidelines will give you a level of 6, 6.5, I think really the clinical assessment is the critical element in terms of consideration. So I think uh, that that's it. Uh, Dr. Liu, did you, would you like to weigh in? Yeah, yeah, um, completely agree. Uh, but if it also depends on what's the cause of the hemolytic anemia, isn't it? Because uh, I, I believe the the person who's asking the question is probably thinking along the lines of immune hemolysis. But of course, if it's non-immune hemolysis, like in the case of your congenital, like your HPH hemolysis, you will certainly transfuse, for instance. So it all, all depends on the uh, underlying cause as well. And and even in hemolytic anemia, even if you want to set a target HB, the blood bank may say that they have no compatible blood for you. It's exactly. in it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that, that's a challenge that um, yes. I face quite more often than not. Okay, so let's go on to the next one. Uh, can we start IV hydrocortisone instead for hemolytic anemia? And is there a specific regimen to taper these steroids? Yeah. Because um, I think in your talk, you mentioned about methylprednisolone, yep. right? And standard prednisolone. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, glucocorticoids in general are all acceptable. But I'd, li I'd like to just highlight the second uh, part of the question there, actually. Um, is there a specific regimen? I don't think that there is. I might be mistaken. But I think the most important underlying concept is a lot of times we talk about, when we talk about tapering steroids, particularly in the case of an immune cytopenia in hematology or in general medicine, there are two main things that we talk about. One is ITP and one is in uh, uh, autoimmune hematic anemia. The real key is that when you are trying to taper off steroids for a case of autoimmune hemolytic anemia, it's really quite important to go a little bit slower than you would with, for example, say ITP. Uh, I think the evidence has really suggested that a slightly slower taper uh, uh, is, is more efficacious in terms of um, maintaining uh, or managing to uh, negate the effects of the hemolysis and also in terms of preventing relapse. I think there isn't a specific regimen per se, but I would say that the general principle is you can taper it uh, as you would with any other immune cytopenia, but really try to go a little bit slower than, than you would with, say, ITP. Uh, Dr. Liu, do you think that's all right? Yeah, um, 
Yes, I, same same experience as you you encounter. You know, it, it's easier to deal with ITP than with with IHA. But at the same time, you also should not. Uh, if the patient is, as your slides have shown, you know, the true remissions are only 20 30 percent, even yep. though the responses are quite high. So you shouldn't also you know keep continuing steroids and not and deny patients a second line regimen. True, you generally is a slow, slightly slower taper, but uh, if the patient is not in that group that is going to achieve uh, remissions, um, do do move on to the uh, second line agents. Yep, absolutely agree. Thanks, Dr. Liu. Okay, let's go on to the next one then. Yeah, let's go on to the next one. Uh, this uh, this question is a patient's blood parameters is suggestive of hemolysis. FPP suggests hemolysis, but no maha. And uh, there's also, also not suggestive of hemoglobinopathies. Coombs test, which was taken post-transfusion, is negative. Can it still be immune hemolysis? It's a bit broad, but see if you want to tackle this. Yeah, so what I understand is there is um, biochemical evidence of hemolysis. You have a full blood picture, which I guess shows hemolysis. And uh, I'm presuming based on the way the question is framed, it's an immune kind of hemolysis and you have no hemoglobinopathies. Coombs test is negative. I guess the answer is yes, because I think that that there that, that exists a really small subgroup of patients with what we call uh, Coombs negative IHA, about 5 to 10% of cases of IHA. Um, so technically, it could, it could still be, and you would think more along the lines of uh, uh, a condition like a Coombs negative IHA. If you have a patient with many other features that suggest that it might be have an autoimmune nature, say the patient has some underlying disease causing immune dysregulation, for example. I think we can sort of link this question to uh, another question by uh, Dr. Arifuddin, who asked about how we would approach DAT negative IHA or Coombs negative IHA. Now, I think that that's that's a really tricky question because the, the major challenge with that is really just um, diagnosing it in the first place uh, when you don't have uh, a Coombs test that really points in one way. You it tends to be really difficult for you to put your foot down and say that this is a case of Coombs negative IHA. And very often or not, the investigative approach is one of uh, ruling out rather than having evidence to rule in anything. Uh, in terms of managing a case of uh, Coombs negative IHA, you would probably try to treat the patient along the lines of, of, of it being a warm IHA, steroids, immunomodulators, and so on and so forth. Yeah, Dr. Liu, uh, over to you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you could discuss with your blood bank. They could try alternative techniques to, uh, you know, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. try and find out. Yeah, because uh, m many of these cases are actually, uh, you know, the, the levels are too. They, they, there is a presence of the IgG, but it's just too low to be detected. Say, you know, using the using the standard tube method, for instance. Yeah, yeah but a lot of times we end up ruling out the other causes. And then, you know, give a trial of steroids. And if they respond, then we consider these patients as uh, Coombs negative. Uh, I yeah. yeah, exactly. And it's not, a, not an easy diagnosis to make, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, which question you want to tackle next? Um, maybe the lymphoma one. Yeah. Uh, someone mentioned about maybe be, since we had Coombs test, someone mentioned about sending Coombs test after back cell transfusion. Would it affect interpretation of results? I think can quickly settle this. Yeah, so um, this is, I think, the bane of all uh, here, blood bank trans transfusion action doctors because uh, um, the problem with patients, particularly in the long term who have had multiple transfusions, is that of course they can develop these allo antibodies. So you can have antibodies that are there as a reaction to previous transfusion or even to pregnancies. And at the same time, they can have all these panagglutinins caused by their own antibodies, which really does make the picture a lot more complicated. Uh, yeah, uh, I guess the short answer to that question is yes. And there are a multitude of ways in which that could be messed up uh, and it could be difficult. So uh, yeah, uh, what do you think, Dr. Liu? Yeah, uh, I mean, of course, as far as possible, try to, but uh, you can still get some some information out of it. Yeah, we are, we are running short of time. Let's quickly go through the others. Okay. Yep. 
this question about a 64-year-old man uh, with chronic hep B presented with symptomatic anemia, loss of weight, loss of appetite. I think this person meant no GI loss because it says no bleeding after that, no traditional meds, clinically jaundice and pale, no lymph nodes, no hepatosminomegaly, a HB that is low 5.5, uh, total white platelets normal, but uh, I'm not sure if it's given, it says full blood picture is verbally normal. So I presume the MCV and all that are normal. Yeah. Do we still consider hemolytic anemia? Coombs negative. Uh, yeah, I, it's pretty hard to answer this. I think there's, I think there's yeah. too few information for us to, yeah, to, yeah, to, to I, be very certain. I guess essentially what uh, this this doctor is trying to illustrate is that there are certain hemolytic markers which are which are which are which are present. Your indirect hyperbilirubinemia. You've got some anemia. Though the LBH is normal, can we still consider hemolytic <laughs> anemia? Yes, the answer a is a bit unlikely. Yes. Oh, yeah. it's a bit hard. <laughs> to be honest, it's a bit hard yeah. to say. Perhaps um, um, uh, more information would, would give us a little bit of context and uh, help a little bit. Yeah. Mm. Okay, now my let's jump on. Uh, next question. Somebody with uh, lymphoma associated IHA, but no biopsy proven. Mm, but steroids is started due to IHA. What would be the way forward as steroids might have obscured the lymph node that patient is having? Oh, it's also, God. it's... Uh... <laughs> yeah, I, I feel this is a very clinically relevant question. And a lot yeah. of times, the steroids are given to treat the IHA and then somewhere along the lines, there's some suggestion there might be lymphoma. I guess it's really quite tricky, which is why I think uh, I, I highlighted in my presentation that there's really it's really important if you have a case of hemolytic anemia to look really hard, especially if you have a co-agglutinin disease, for any possible evidence of lymphoproliferative disorder without a tissue or histological confirmation of a lymphoma, it's going to be extremely difficult to treat the patient. So um, what would be the approach? I guess, firstly, have a high index of suspicion. Try really hard to search for lymphoproliferative disorders. Ascertain your histological confirmation. If you have missed the boat and you have started treatment, I guess, you would still try to get a biopsy and hope against all odds that you do get some histological information. But uh, yeah, I, I guess that the rule of thumb is just try to identify it as early as possible. Dr. Liu, what do you think? Yeah, sometimes when you miss the boat or it's a, you didn't suspect from the beginning, uh, these cases will eventually relapse. Yeah. Oh, oh. You know, as you cut the steroids, they eventually relapse and that's when that's your other opportunity for you to you know investigate then of course it will be a much more delayed investigation that had you suspected from the beginning yeah. okay uh regarding an IHA case and uh, then so we jump on to another question uh regarding an IHA case our labs sometimes have difficulty to get actual rbc count and actual mcv even though we try to incubate the sample i think this is referring to cold agglutinin disease yeah how would your lab have your how your laboratory and laboratory, uh, I suppose, counter this problem? Sometimes we need to ask patients to go to the lab to take blood. I think this is your problem more with the cold uh, agglutinin disease. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I, I don't see a way out unless or you use a pre one tube. Yeah, that that probably would be the only way, and I guess a lot of um yeah communication with your lab and try to coordinate things as as best as you can. But uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with you in, on that case. Yep. Is there any role for steroid sparing immunosuppressant once we have taken off steroids? Yep, yep. Um, obviously, what, doc, what Dr. Liu alluded to in one of the first few questions we answered, we try to keep patients off steroids. I mean, if, especially if we're talking about long-term or chronic care, you try to get them off steroids and steroid sparing immunosuppressants do play a role. Uh, uh, I think the simple answer to that is yes, but of, obviously um, the first line treatment is usually used in the emergent or clinical uh, emergent situation. And of course you will try to, in the long term, get your, get your immunosuppressants, uh, steroid sparing immunosuppressants in, in the backbone of therapy. Is there a target hemoglobin in uh, autoimmune multi anemia? I don't know if there is, a, <laughs> <laughs> is there, but I guess I, I agree. I don't think that, yeah. Those are normal as possible would be, would be nice, yeah. 
I mean, like you alluded to, a lot of patients in remission are not truly remission. They just yeah. enter this state of compensated hemolysis yeah. that they have a reasonable hemoglobin. And if, if, they, if the bone marrow can cope, I think we can accept yeah. that. Yeah. And a lot of it is just really correlating with how the patient is doing clinically. Uh, if you have a patient that's fairly asymptomatic but doesn't have the normal hemoglobin that we all desire, then I guess that's okay. But uh, it's really just taking into account a lot of the different um, factors. Any role of steroids in DTPHUS? Uh, I suppose DTP will answer the short answer will be yes, uh, but not not so much for HUS. Yeah, not, true, not so much for HUS. Yeah. For TDP, you're going, you're going to give your, your IV steroids together with your plasma exchange in concert. For HUS, uh, no. Uh, the key really is uh, uh, your complement inhibitors. That, that, and of course, uh, plasma exchange is a supportive measure. So yeah, that's a short answer. Uh, according to your presentation, reticulocyte is one of the urgent parameters. However, not all BOCD full blood count tests uh, can provide the reticulocyte count, especially in district hospital. Um, your answer to that? Uh, absolutely agree with you. Uh, I, I recognize that particularly for some institutions that there might not be access to all the tests. I wouldn't say that it is a, 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 it's an important test, no doubt about it, but I wouldn't say that it's absolutely mandatory. I would say that whatever's available to you, whatever you can interpret together with your clinical picture will probably give you an idea. You don't need a reticular site count to say that this is definitely hemolytic anemia or not. Uh, it's good to have, but it's not absolutely mandatory, I would say. And sometimes you can use a proxy. If you have a patient that has unexplained macrocytosis and reticulocytes tend to be a bit larger than mature red cells, that sort of gives you a clue in a way, not exactly the same, but uh, it's, a, it's something comparable, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, someone asked quite this question. Can hemolytic anemia present with direct hyperbilirubinemia predominant instead of indirect? There can actually be, it doesn't necessarily, the typical description is that of an unconjugated or indirect hyperbilirubinemia. But you actually can have an element of direct hyperbilirubinemia or conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Whether or not it is predominant, I don't think so. I think the unconjugated element is usually a little bit more, uh, a little bit more overt. But yes, um, they can both be present, and I think that's that's one of the uh, uh, it's something to pay attention to and not to discount that fact when when considering um, the bilirubin levels. Well, what I normally see is uh, I mean doing the acute hemolysis, I mean, all will be up. Or it's, I've, it's still the indirect that will, will predominate. But yes, if you were to look at the absolute values itself, yes, it will be high. But I doubt you will actually have a scenario where the, the direct will predominate. Unless, of course, patients with other issues like you know, gallstone disease and all that, 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 that might confound your picture. Okay, we are running out of time, but now let's just finish one last question. Uh, chronic hemolytic anemia secondary to thalassemia. How do you approach it? I think it's a completely different thing. It's a whole lecture in itself. Uh, maybe we just want to give a short answer. Um, I think in chronic hemolytic anemia, the oh, in thalassemia, sorry, the, your main treatment is going to be firstly um, transfusions, but also at the same time, balancing out with good iron chelation monitoring for complications, not just of the disease, but monitoring of complications of the different treatment modalities, and also not forgetting the fact that um, uh, these patients require a lot of uh, uh, supportive and collaborative care with other departments. I don't think the hemolysis in itself is particularly the main issue with regards to thalassemia. I think it's really the dealing with the anemia and dealing with the long-term complications that warrants our immediate attention. Probably just to add the, the, the alpha thalassemias and also some of uh, our uh, e-beta thalassemias do can, during, during periods of uh, infections or so stress can undergo this hemolytic crisis. Uh, I think the main state of, of management in those scenarios will be, you know, just have to just transfuse them up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Somebody put it in a chat instead of the Q&A. If you get the referral for positive debt and not hemolysis, what would be your advice? I will just leave them alone. <laughs> but it's a thing to consider that this patient may have other underlying uh, autoimmune disorders. No, look hard for other things that could possibly yeah. be positivity. Autoimmune diseases will yeah. definitely be high yeah. on that list. Yep.
All right. Uh, I think we have a good, very good session. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Thank you very much for an excellent and very comprehensive overview of this very broad topic. And I'm sure all of us have learned a lot from this session. Time, we are actually over time. Again, thank you all. Thank you, everyone, for attending this uh, webinar session. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Thank you.